Uh, I'm just going to start speaking and assume that it will sort of form some kind of order um, as I talk. Um, I'm Ware Harmon. I'm the executive director of Town Hall. I don't need to clutch this quite so tight. Um, on behalf of our staff, uh, our friends at UW Press, and our friends at the University Bookstore, it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program with Mimi Gardner-Gates, Linda Mapes, and Katharina Manchanda. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. In a moment, I'll introduce you to University of Washington Press Director Nicole Mitchell, um, who will in turn introduce tonight's speakers. Um, in the meantime, it falls to me to share all the town hall infomercial, which I hope is more info than mercial to most of you. But at any rate, uh, the pr uh, presentation will run around 60 minutes, including Q&A. To submit your questions, um, even if you're here in the room, uh, we're asked that you use um, uh, meet.ps forward slash gates. If you put that URL in your phone, or this is where it gets even weirder, you can use the QR code while you're here, and then you can pose your questions electronically, and they'll be merged with the folks who are watching at home into one happy pile of questions that I will pose later on when I um, am running that part of the event. Um, We'll try to get to as many as possible, I promise. And uh, also a reminder, by the way, if you're watching at home, you can, um, you can use the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player uh, and enable closed captioning. It's truly the only advantage of being at home right now, I promise. Uh, Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming this weekend, KOW's 70th birthday celebration here in the forum. Uh, in June, Gage Academy of Arts uh, co of Art co-founder Gary Fagan will discuss the work and life of the late artist Mike Spafford uh, with Mike's wife, Elizabeth Sandvig and son Spike Mafford. Looking beyond, check our calendar for appearances by David Duchovny, Ibram X. Kendi, Michael Pollan, the final of this year's Global Rhythm series uh, from the genre bending Korean pop folk act Ak Dan Gwang. And after, it's going to be really fun. Um, and after 14 years as artistic director of our Town Music Chamber series, Joshua Roman's final program in that chair, which naturally he's calling a cello bration because he's corny like that, <laughs> but we love him. Uh, there's plenty more to explore on our website, too, so you can go there for all that. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. As part of our Arts and Culture series, tonight's program is supported by For Culture, the City of Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, Arts Fund, and the Washington State Arts Commission. But as you likely know, Town Hall is underneath it all a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members, um, uh, whether you're here tonight or watching from home, um, for making this place possible for the whole community. If you share their vision, Town Hall's view, vision, um, uh, that this region is strengthened by discussions of civic life, science, um, arts, and culture, we hope you'll consider joining us as a member, too. There is one more thing to say. Um, I know you'll want to go deeper on tonight's topic and have a wonderful keepsake um, of the park for when you're not around. I hope you'll pick up a copy of Mimi Gardner-Gates' book, Seattle's Olympic Sculpture Park, um, right over there uh, in the auto bar. And then afterwards, she'll be signing over on that side in the, uh, in the library. Uh, if you're at home, none of that applies. But you can go to a link over on the right side in the chat field, uh, and it'll take you directly to our friends at University Bookstore, who will be supplying the books no matter where you happen to be. Um, I lied. There's one more thing I want to say, which is that there's nothing we like so much at Town Hall than to celebrate the successes of this community. And not to be corny, but if OSP is anything, it's a phenomenal success for this community. And I personally want to thank um, Mimi, Katharina, everybody at SAM, all the folks who gave and made that project happen as a gift to all the rest of us sincerely for, um, for this place that's just transformed uh, life in Seattle generally, and uh, throwing down an important marker for what's possible on our waterfront. So with all of that, um, thanks. And it's now my pleasure to welcome University of Was Washington Press Director, Nicole Mitchell, who will in turn introduce our speakers. Nicole. Sorry, he's allowed to take my mask off, so thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Nicole Mitchell, Director of the University of Washington Press. Uh, for those of you who may not know our work, uh, the press is a self-sustaining, mission-driven, non-profit publisher based at the University of Washington. Uh, we also happen to be the oldest and largest publisher of scholarly and general interest books in the Pacific Northwest. We are so delighted to be partnering with Sam uh, to market and distribute this new book, 
hold it up here, on the Olympic Sculpture Park, edited by Mimi Gates and beautifully produced by local art book packager, uh, Lucia Markwind, and I think Ed Markwind is here, so thank you for that. It's my great honor to introduce this evening's presenters, three remarkably accomplished women who have made and continue to make a profound difference to the intellectual and cultural life and well-being of our Seattle community. Mimi Gardner-Gates, now Director Emerita, was Director of the Seattle Art Museum for 15 highly productive years. Under her leadership, the Olympic Sculpture Park was envisioned and created, and the downtown museum significantly expanded. Mimi Gates is a scholar of Chinese art and holds degrees in art history from both Stanford University and Yale University. Prior to moving to Seattle, she was curator of Asian art and subsequently director of the Yale art University Art Gallery. In the field of Chinese art, she has taught, published articles and essays, and organized numerous exhibitions, including Stories of Porcelain at the Seattle Art Museum and Cave Temples of Don Wang, Buddhist Art on China's Silk Road, a major exhibition at the Getty Center in Los Angeles. Currently, she chairs the Dun Wangs Foundation and the board, board of managers of the Blakemore Foundation. She also serves on the boards of Heritage University, the Seattle Symphony, the San Francisco Asian Art Museum, the Northwest African Art Museum, sorry, Northwest African American Museum, and Copper Canyon Press. Mimi Gates is a former fellow of the Yale Corporation and founder of the Gardner Gates Gardner Center for Asian Art and Ideas at the Seattle Art Museum. Linda Mapes, uh, who will go after Mimi in terms of presentations, is a longtime reporter at the Seattle Times, where she specializes in coverage of the environment and indigenous cultures and governments. She's won numerous awards for her reporting, including the International 2019 and 2012 Kavli Gold Award for Science Journalism from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the world's largest professional science association. In 2016, she was recognized by NOAA Fisheries for the prestigious Dr. Nancy Foster Habitat Conservation Award for her reporting on fish and habitat. In addition to her staff position at the Seattle Times, Linda is an associate of the Harvard Forest at Harvard University in Petersham, Massachusetts. Linda is also the author of six books. The press was fortunate enough to have worked with her on her very first book, Breaking Ground, and also more, more recently on the paperback edition of Witness Tree, which explores the human and natural history of a single hundred-year-old oak in the Harvard Forest. Her latest book, Orca, Shared Waters, Shared Home, about the southern resident orcas and their struggle to survive, won the 2021 National Outdoor Book Award. I'm excited to announce that Linda has just received a second prestigious Bullard Fellowship from the Harvard Forest for the coming academic year to write a new book about the importance of old growth forests to indigenous ecology and cultures and the survival of our planet. And finally, uh, Katerina Manchanda is the John and Mary Shirley Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Seattle Art Museum. Since joining SAM in 2011, she has curated a number of notable exhibitions for SAM, including Pop Departures, City Dwellers, Figuring History, and most recently, Frisson, the Richard E. Lang and Jane Lang Davis collection. She is a contributor to the exhibition catalogue Barbara Earl Thomas, The Geography of Innocence, and the editor of the catalogue for Frisson, both just distributed by UW Press. Prior to joining SAM, Katerina was senior curator of exhibitions at the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, Ohio. She has also held curatorial positions at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum in St. Louis, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Guggenheim Museum, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Originally from Germany, uh, Katerina has an MA in Art History from the University of Delaware and a PhD in Art History from the City University of New York where she wrote her dissertation on conceptual art and photography in Germany in the 1960s and 70s. Please join me in welcoming this evening's presenters. I think you're in for a real treat. Uh, Mimi, I think over to you.
Thank you, Nicole, for your kind introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you who are here tonight, and I welcome all the people who are on Zoom. And uh, I also would like to express gratitude to tonight's speakers and <clears throat> to Kate Hecock of University of Washington Press, to my co-editor, Renee Devine, who is here, to University Bookstore for selling our, our book, and to Ware Harmon and Candace Wilkinson Davis and the other staff members of Town Hall for organizing tonight's event. The focus is the Olympic Sculpture Park, which is something Seattle can be proud of, a new paradigm for civic space in the 21st century. And the recently published book, which Nicole showed you, uh, entitled Seattle's Olympic Sculpture Park. The six essays in the book, they're informative and engaging. Each is written in a different voice and from a different perspective and amplify the Olympic Sculpture Park. The book is beautifully produced by Lucia Marquand, and Ed is here, which is great. <laughs> and they did just a beautiful job. It's published by the Seattle Art Museum and distributed by the University of Washington Press. So let me... What inspired the book is the fact that the Olympic Sculpture Park is a model civic project which demonstrates that by forming public-private partnerships, nonprofit organizations, such as an art museum, and in this case, the Seattle Art Museum, can successively realize an ambitious vision that significantly improves the quality of life and strengthens the infrastructure of its community. Owned and operated by the Seattle Art Museum, the Olympic Sculpture Park is audacious, bold, innovative, featuring Seattle's greatest asset aside from people, its spectacular natural setting on the edge of Puget Sound. And it captures the, young, the young, youthful, expansive spirit of our city and region. From 1995 to 2007, the Seattle Art Museum turned the last parcel of undeveloped waterfront, a dreary brownfield, into one of the world's great sculpture parks, open and free to all. Seen here from above, the Z-shaped design zigs and zags. As art historian Barry Bergdahl of Columbia University notes, the park itself is a sculpted, sculpted work of art. And in his insightful lead essay in the book, Barry traces the history of parks from the Olmsted brothers to the 21st century, and in doing so, places Seattle's sculpture park in a global context. He also relates the history of museum gardens and parks. Geographically, he, as he says, he zigs and zags. Uh, his essay ranges uh, geographically from the U.S. and Europe, and always returning to places in Seattle. Actually, his knowledge of Seattle is quite extraordinary. One of the interesting things he notes is that in covering reservoirs, Seattle in the 1990s created an additional 90 acres of open space. It's full of really uh, fascinating uh, facts. And with few exceptions, uh, the images that you'll see on the screen are found in the book, and many are gorgeous double spreads. And for example, uh, the valley dominated by the massive undulating steel plates of Wake, a major work by Richard Serra, one of the great artists. And you'll hear about the art from curator Katerina Machanda. And in terms of equity and inclusion, the Olympic Sculpture Park was ahead of its time 
as it's free of charge and open to all. It opens from a half an hour before dawn to half an hour after dusk and is protected by security cameras and guards who are on site 24 seven. As the Seattle Art Museum director Amada Cruz states in her foreword to the book, there is perhaps no better compliment than that most people think that the Olympic Sculpture Park is a city park. It belongs to all. In the foreground, you see Roxy Payne's uh, stainless steel tree. And at sunset, Roxy Payne's split in, in, the, in the foreground, Teresita Fernandez's Seattle cloud cover in the background silhouetted against the sunset. Just showing you some of the, of the really stunning images that are in the book. And photographer Robert Wade is here. Um, also, Louise Bourgeois' father and son benches, which are down by the shore. And there were a constant stream of bikers and joggers trans, uh, go by the waterfront. Louise Bourgeois' fountain marks the entry to the, to, broad and, to the park at Broad and Alaskan Way. Opening day, January 20th, 2007, 23,000 people poured through the park. And it, the port park seamlessly integrates landscape, art, ecology, and urban infrastructure. I think one of the marvelous things is that the movement of people and dogs, trains and cars make the park come alive. But the park's also a refuge, a place to slow down, to breathe and enjoy the natural beauty of Seattle's waterfront as well as the art. And it reconnecting our, our city to the waters of Puget Sound. So what sets the Olympic Sculpture Park apart from other sculpture parks? That's a question worth pondering. Tonight, however, I would like to tell you the story of a marvelous tale of serendipity of the creation of this extraordinary waterfront sculpture park, which is the basis of my essay in the book. How did the sculpture park come about? Whose idea was it? What were the challenges? In 1995, John and Mary Shirley, inspired by the many sculpture parks they'd seen on their travels throughout Europe and Asia, initiated and championed the idea of creating a sculpture park in Seattle. And this was over many, many years. The first person with whom they discussed the idea was Jenny Wright a uh, civic and cultural leader who you see in the image on your right. Both the Wrights and the Shirleys are collectors of world-class outdoor sculpture. And they wanted to put leave, have their sculpture stay permanently in Seattle and be ex accessible to all. But there was no place to put it. They envisioned a park owned and operated by the Seattle Art Museum. So as a museum director, I was brought into the conversation. My response, let's do it. How, how to move the project forward? And, and uh, what would, how, to, how to find an appropriate site? And <clears throat> on the right, the helicopter <laughs> marks the next critical moment in the evolution of the park. It took, was, uh, it, in Mongolia that we had a helicopter crash and stand, standing in the field waiting to be rescued, Martha Wyckoff, who you see in the center in the red jacket, she was on the board of the National Trust for Public Land. And she and I discussed the need for land for a sculpture park. And when she returned to Seattle, Martha enlisted the Trust for Public, Public Land who agreed to help. 
and they proved to be an invaluable partner. Much of the fact that the sculpture park was realized was due to, to partnerships. And subsequently, Chris Rogers, who's in the far right, then a staff member of the Trust for Public Land, and actually also a Seattleite, and later project manager of the Olympic Sculpture Park, scoured the city in, for a site for the sculpture park, and available land was incredibly scarce. In the summer of 1997, perseverance paid off. Union Oil of California, also known as Unical, owned the last parcel of undeveloped waterfront. And you can see it here in the foreground, a dreary, a very dreary brown field. Six acres in size, used for petroleum distribution actually for over 75 years. And it had been under remediation for the past 10 years. And de developers were salivating. Our timing was impeccable. If we had been one month later, that land today would, have, would be the site of 800 condominiums, retail shops, and a gym. It, there was something about the park that all these factors came together, and the timing was certainly one of them. And the partnership between the Seattle Art Museum, the Trust for Public Land, and the city, and our mutual determination to make the park a reality was critical in negotiating environmental agreements. Uh, they were extensive, they were very complex, and this was a difficult site, but we succeeded in obtaining the first option to purchase it for $16.5 million, but we had to raise the money within a period originally said to be five months. We eventually did get an extension. And we obtained that first option to purchase it. And a bit earlier, shortly after John and Mary Shirley saw the site, they challenged me and the museum. If the Seattle Art Museum would raise the funds to purchase the Unical site and develop the sculpture park, the Shirleys would endow its operating budget. The project was on go. And that, there, that was the best in philanthropy I can ever imagine. It meant that the park would be open and free to all and well maintained. So that's why everybody thinks it's a public park, but it's really, gr it's just, uh, it, it, it was a, a call I never expected to receive and it, they also, the Shirley's also generously enabled the museum to acquire the iconic red stable eagle by Alexander Calder. So the Shirley's had naming rights for the park. They did not name it after themselves. <laughs> they named it after the Olympic mountains, which it faces. And it was interesting, we had to clear the right to use the word Olympic with the Olympic Committee. <laughs> Fortunately, I think because of the geography here, they, uh, they, they were very accommodating. But as soon as Unical granted Sam the first option, we started intensively fundraising, and that's a story in itself. And in 1999, Sam purchased the land. The question that we asked ourselves in considering our vision for the sculpture park was what would speak Seattle and be a civic space appropriate to our city? And we traveled widely, not only in the United States, but also in Europe. An international design competition was held, funded by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Target Foundation. 52 teams, Artists, architects, landscape artists applied. And we selected Weissman Freddie, 
Architecture, Landscape, Urbanism of New York City. Um, did you see Mary and Michael on the right? <clears throat> and that was a choice that we never regretted. And on the, the left, you see the concept for the park, which actually they took a name card in a bar and cut it. But they will admit that there was a whole lot of head scratching uh, and a lot of thinking that went into it. They did extensive research and they presented this, the design for the, for the Z-shaped path that runs through the park at the competition. And that really was what I think convinced everybody that, uh, that they were the right ones to design the park. And in the book, Marion and Michael discuss the thinking that lay beyond, behind their design for the Seattle Sculpture Park and how that project changed their architectural practice. So a comparison illustrates, I think today many of us forget what the park was prior to its creation. And uh, the architects at that time, they were incredibly thoughtful. They asked, how might this project reinforce the immeasurable power of art and landscape together? How could this park generate new relationships between the city and Puget Sound? So what were the challenges we faced? Many requiring patience and, and perseverance. There were so many challenges. Chris Rogers used to joke that it was, it was, it was issue 210 or something like that. But, uh, you know, one thing, after the Nisqually earthquake in 2001, the city and state and county proposed three different alternative solutions for viaduct replacement. And one of them was a tunnel under the park. And that forced us to delay for 18 months. And, but fortunately, in the end, the engineers all agreed that it was a bad idea. Uh, so for the, one ch the challenge from the very outset was how to connect the three parcels of land. And then the architects were grappled with that idea. They did not want two bridges in three parks. <laughs> and the land was in three parcels, so, but the bold Z-path design was a brilliant answer. It zigs and zags and unites the formerly segmented parcels of land and connects the city to the waterfront. Four landscape precincts, which uh, this is one image that's not in the book, but it shows the valley, the meadows, the grove, and the shore. Four different ecological precincts uh, in, the, in the park that are joined together by the connectivity of the sea path. And this aerial view over Broad uh, and Elliot is, it gives a sense of how the architects capitalized on the urban infrastructure and embedded the railroad in the, and the major roadway into the design. And that was one thing with Marion and Michael, is they were determined to, they took what most people would consider to be obstacles and made them into opportunities. And they always say the greater the, the, greater the challenge, the more they're motivated. So I always think that is, lays also behind this design. And it required, their design required putting 200 cubic yards of soil on top of the site. So that was added. So another small challenge, uh, on the right is a David Horsey cartoon. <laughs> and some people will remember this, which we had the challenge, there was a trolley barn in the middle of the park. And uh, the trolley was no longer in operation because of construction already underway to, uh, down on the, on, the, uh, on the waterfront. But 
removing the trolley barn, and Ron Simpson said, county executive said, I'll, I'll make sure it's removed. But it turned into a public relations nightmare because when the barn was demolished, the Seattle Art Museum was unfairly blamed for shutting down the waterfront vintage trolley. And in, in fact, the museum looked positively on the trolley because they saw it as a mode of transportation, but it engendered a wave of negative pu uh, publicity. The David Horsey cartoon says, say, isn't this one of the trolleys that used to run along the waterfront? It's titled, End of the Line, a, remem a Remembrance of the Idiots at Metro, the Art Museum, and City Hall. <laughs> so there was lots. That was, that was one of the better ones. <laughs> um, make way for ducklings. Oh, wait a minute. Some, somehow, there, yeah, sorry. Um, a mother duck in 2005 decided to use the construction debris to create a nest and lay her eggs. And after consulting Audubon, the museum decided to delay construction for 28 days until, <laughs> until the ducklings were hatched and were old enough to follow their mother down to the water. And Chris Rogers actually stopped the Burlington Northern train so they could cross safely cross the train track. <laughs> so they, these were just some of the major challenges that we faced. But what was so inspirational was that everybody was determined to succeed, to realize the park. And uh, succeed we did. So predating the, the viaduct's removal, the Sculpture Park, I think it demonstrated the, the remarkable possibilities of reclaiming the waterfront as civic space. And our success, we hoped, would give others the courage and confidence that through public-private partnerships, they could achieve major projects formerly thought to be out of reach. The Olympic Sculpture Park was a, a catalyst for the proposed redesign of the water central waterfront with an expansive park by James Corner and for Expedia's transformation of the northern waterfront beyond the Sculpture Park. And if you haven't walked there, you, you definitely should. Ask Waterfront Seattle for a tour of what they're doing and walk up north of the Sculpture Park. Eventually, you're going to have a, a waterfront that is really celebrates the beauty of the Seattle's natural setting. And I think the, maybe the greatest thing the Sculpture Park accomplished was just to show what the possibilities are. And now that's going to be a continuum You'll be able to go from the stadiums all the way to Magnolia Bridge. And Ma Maggie Walker is here from the from Waterfront Seattle. And she can, uh, she can elaborate on their plans and where they are. And I think what's so true is in today's world, in today's world, that's green spaces, Waterfront walks, parks, they're not just desirable, they're a necessity. And I want to conclude with the words of Raymond Gastill. And I quote, from Barcelona to Seattle, there is increasing evidence that spectacular talents can join with a city's communities and leadership to redesign and renew a public realm. Architecture and design in those cities is seen as valid cultural expression integral to a city's experience and growth. Thank you. Now Linda Mapes.
Hi, everybody. Wasn't that fun? Thank you, Mimi. So when you're an, envir when you're an environmental reporter, um, you don't get to tell a lot of happy stories. <laughs> Not a lot of good news. But I think one of the great joys of doing the chapter that I did on this book was this is such an incredible accomplishment and such a triumph and really such a happy story. Um, I want to talk a little bit, just briefly, about what is so special about this park uh, in terms of its setting. So we all know it's got a great view. We all know it has great art. But to me, what is so incredible about this park and what it has accomplished, it's really a, it's a remarkable setting uh, like none other. This is a park that reflects an embrace and a return to what was there before, but also a renewal and a coexistence with nature. And what I love about the park, which is so cool, is it, you know, it has really been embraced, not only by us, but by the animals. <laughs> it's actually really quite a hit with all kinds of animals, all kinds of insects, all kinds of birds. Um, the native plants that were planted there have absolutely flourished, and they embrace the art, and the art embraces them. And as you'll see in a moment, um, this idea of revitalizing the waterfront it happened not only for those of us who walk the waterfront and enjoy the park at the waterfront, but it actually happened for the species under the water as well. So um, this, this beautiful photograph here kind of says it all. You, you see this Cooper's hawk that's flying right through um, Richard Serra's wake. And this is, this is the kind of feeling that you have when you go to the park. It's, it's not a static experience. You're not, and I think this is one of the things that Mimi and, and all the others at Sam so wanted to accomplish was you wanted to be outdoors and experience art in a setting that was multi-dimensional and, and indeed that is what you get when you go there. So let's, let's go back in time and acknowledge that this is a place that has always been special to the people of Seattle, all the way back to the very beginning when this of course was and still is a place of rich abundance. It was utilized first of course by the Coast Salish people for generations uncounted. Um, we came along and began using this place in a very different way. This, this brought displacement, dislocation, even dismemberment of this site which this park has um, really begun to heal and set right and put back together. It was for many years a fuel dock. And we think to ourselves, how could that be? How would, how would anyone use a place so beautiful, such a perfect setting for uh, basically transferring petroleum? Well, that's how it was 100 years ago. We, we thought we had endless landscape. We thought we had endless everything. And we were trying to work on other things. And so we used this for a fuel dock for a long, long time. And so with that gone, suddenly you had this in-between sort of ugly duckling of a site, uh, not the lovely ducklings of later, <laughs> but the ugly duckling. And what do you do with it? How in the world do you even use it? I think like many of us here tonight, I'm, I'm overwhelmed at the vision of the people who looked at it when it was still the ugly duckling and saw beauty. One of the other things that they did was rather than being scared off by the challenges of this site, as Mimi told you, they were just all the more encouraged with what might be possible at this site because you really could have a unique chance to start over. Well, that was true not only on the uplands, but it was also true where the land met the water. Once again, where there were problems, they saw opportunities. Where they had a problem with the seawall, Instead of this incredibly expensive uh, redo of a conventional seawall, sea they scratched their heads and they came up with something completely different, which is what you see here, creating a habitat bench. And you're thinking, well, what in the world is that? Well, what it really was was a way to deal with the seawall problem that also invited life back to what had been a sheer wall. Instead, now you have this softening of the landscape. You have a bench that brings up a little bit of place for animal life to take cover and utilize that near shore, and then once again dip down. And so you think to yourself, huh, sounds kind of fancy. Does it really work? Ha, huh, I can prove it. <laughs> I actually was very curious about that for myself. I heard about this seawall idea, and I knew that we were doing more seawall work down there on the waterfront. And I was really curious, could that really work in a place that had been so industrially altered and so Jason Toft, a biologist at the University of Washington and I, got into our dry suits and we walked right on into Puget Sound right there at the waterfront and we put on our snorkels and our masks and here's what we saw. 
baby Chinook salmon, herring. The place is absolutely booming with life. And I mean right on the other side of the wall. I took the snorkel out of my, lap, my mouth and I looked up and I wanted to shout to everyone going by on the path, Puget Sound is alive. <laughs> Our neighbors, they're all right here. And so I think what is so exciting about this is that it's so important to remember that we have these chances and when we take them, it works. Mother Nature comes back and so quickly if you provide these opportunities, these habitats. And so this was done at the near shore and at the seawall. And this was that first inkling of, well, what could we do that would invite nature back and would it work? And it did. I wanna talk a little bit now about the land. This again was a healing and a bringing back together of a place that had literally been cut to pieces. Remember now, you've got the train tracks, you've got the roads, you have these islands that are separated by hardscape. Well, one of the geniuses of this, of this design was that you brought unity back from the uplands all the way down to the water. But not only that, there was a recreation of the different habitats of Puget Sound country. And this was done in four different precincts, as Mimi said, from the forest all the way down to the water. And so what is the result of this? You wind up with this unique pleasure ground that is really an outdoor library of native plants. The, the original Lachute seed names were, wrought, were brought back and put on signs for all of the plants. All of the plants are labeled, so if you don't know your native plants, you can go there and can learn about everything from the ancient species all the way back to ginkgo trees, all the way down to the shore. And so to go to the sculpture park, again, is this multi-dimensional experience from upland all the way to saltwater, completely connected by a 100% accessible path. And you can learn about plants, you can enjoy the art, and you can actually even for the first time in a century dip your toes in salt water. I can't tell you the amount of enjoyment that I witnessed people having at this little tiny pocket beach. I, there's something about water. We ourselves are mostly water. We need to be in contact with Puget Sound and this for the first time in so long was where people could actually go and be on a saltwater beach. And I think one of the things I love about this is this is a park about art and sculpture. And you see people down there with that, I guess it's baked into our DNA, this need to make art, stacking cairns and moving little pieces of, of, of wood around and, and creating even themselves their own sculptures at this beach. Here's the other thing. This is a very acoustic space. You've got the trains going in and out and you have this, this again, this instinct to take what could be kind of a problem. It is a sculpture park and we all think of museums as quiet, hushed places. We're supposed to keep it down. This is such an exuberant park. You have the sound of the trains and the whistles, the sense of, of connection to places beyond and people coming to you and people going somewhere else. It's, it's an exciting place to be. And needless to say, um, for the train spotters and train buffs, where else can you stand but the Seattle Sculpture Park to enjoy trains in such a safe environment? And it is startling because you'll be lost in reverie looking at a sculpture and all of a sudden, there goes the BNSF. <laughs> this is one of the most unusual pieces of the sculpture park. Um, I love this. This is the greenhouse and it's, it's down there off by itself. It looks, um, you know, you see it and it's green glass and you wonder what could it be. This is a bit of a visitation. Um, what, what you see here is a visitation indeed from the Green River. This is an old growth log that was brought intact and whole into the greenhouse and allowed to persist into its great age, continuing to gradually do what old growth logs do, which is break down into its many, 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 many millions of little tiny bits and parts. As we all know, um, trees when they die, they're only just beginning their next life. And I, th I think this is, again, we heard the word audacious tonight. Well, this is audacious as a work of art. And it is a reminder of ourselves, of our own, our own mortality, but also our persistence into further time in another form. I want to say that uh, this park is a hit, <laughs> not only with people, but with the animals. Uh, not long after the park was completed and the beach was brought back, here comes this little baby seal, little pup, just resting on the beach. 
I mean, talk about an endorsement. <laughs> Uh, you, you'll see birds there at just about any time. And of course, there's the great experience of the weather. Because it has this expansive view of the western sky and a view even all the way down to Mount Rainier where you can spin around and see the city, you know, there's the, there's the great experience of the weather just washing over you, the seasons of clouds and light. Every hour is different, every season is different, every day is different. It truly is a place that, that invites you back over and over and over. And I think that these sunsets are, are really just non parallel This is a place to take a picnic and just sit and be quiet and enjoy. It's a place to take guests. It's a place to, to just be by yourself. It's, um, you know, it, it, it just truly is, I think, really even beyond perhaps the imagining of those who thought, well, let's just try it and see what we can do. And so with that, I, I want to say thank you to everyone here who's here tonight to hear this story. But mostly, I want to say thank you to the people who brought us this beautiful gift for all time. <laughs> Katharina. Good evening, everyone. And um, I'm going to start, let me see if this goes back one more time. I'm going to start where um, both Mimi and um, Linda left off, namely the extraordinary beauty of the site. And I want to thank Mimi in particular for inviting me because I'm really a latecomer to the Olympic Sculpture Park. I came to Seattle in uh, 2011, so five years after you had uh, your opening celebration. And the trees had grown already, everything was lush, the park was utterly perfect and just um, presented um, this opportunity for programming, right? So you had the um, existing amazing sculptures, and of course, um, Calder's Eagle has made uh, several appearances in this presentation already, because I really think of it as um, the reigning mascot uh, of the park, uh, soaring high. I mean, his I, I can't imagine a better site uh, for this sculpture, as well as the others. And I really want to also credit Lisa Corrin, who was a curator of modern and contemporary art at the time, working closely with Mimi and an entire team of people at the museum. Because for those of you perhaps less familiar with these processes, Trying to cite sculpture is one of the hardest things imaginable. And the thing is, you can usually do it only once because it's extremely difficult. You need cranes, you need city permits, um, everything that goes into it. In this case, because we're in a seismic zone, you need geological you know, assessments. I don't even want to know um, uh, everything that went into it. Um, and so um, the fact that each of these uh, pieces, all of them are uh, gifts to the Olympic Sculpture Park from many extraordinary donors, um, including, of course, John and Mary Shirley, who gifted um, the eagle to the park, is just such a feat, and I enjoy it um, every single day. So um, the things I wanted to share with you is perhaps just a reminder of the different kinds of artistic programs that have been unfolding uh, at the park. So on the one hand, we have what is essentially a gorgeous outdoor arena in which people can uh, come. And I remember what I found so inspiring when um, you know, I came to the Seattle Art Museum uh, and even interviewed for the position was, the amazing thing about the park is that people enter a sculpture park without even knowing they're having um, an art experience. You know, they come to walk their dogs, they come for a stroll, they come with their bikes, and then they experience this incredible uh, beauty. And um, Linda already touched on um, one of the three specific commissions for the park, the New Convivarium by Mark Dion, a living organism that continues to grow. Um, and um, that was specifically uh, for the inauguration um, of the park, making sure there would be um, work by younger artists uh, responding to the site specifically. And then 
Um, I think that was with Michael Darling, who followed me uh, as curator of modern and contemporary art. The beginning of, um, you know, it would be wonderful to have perhaps projects at the park that are more responsive, that can be changing uh, every now and again to kind of supplement some of the extraordinary sculptures uh, that are permanently in the park. So what do you have on the screen right now? And I'm just going to show you three of these temporary projects um, some of the more recent ones uh, we've done at the park. Usually they open um, you know, in the spring or summer as we're heading into the beautiful uh, season. This one is by Tammy Cotiel, an artist who works with um, augmented reality and is very much engaged um, in issues of climate change. We heard all about the water. The water surrounds the park um, and is, um, of course, our life source on this planet. And so she uh, created um, this uh, project called The Gardens of the Anthropocene. This was back in 2016. And um, perhaps I'm just going to give you another a slide here. So what, what you could do is, on this little um, uh, column that we had in the park was a description of the project. There was a little um, you know, uh, QR code that you could scan. And then images such as these would pop up on your uh, device as you were moving through the park. Perhaps some of you could experience it. Now, if you look closely, you can see not only she imagined species crazy flowers that are not native to this area that um, are likely going to populate um, uh, the lands going in the, uh, you know, surrounding us here, including the Olympic Sculpture Park, if climate change continues um, as, uh, as it, it has so far. And more than that, look at those algae floating near the top of the horizon line. This is going to be the water line um, in the future. And Obviously, you know, you would use your device and you turn around and completely different images would come up. I think one of my, um, the, the f more funny things she included was street signs floating in the water and such uh, um, other such details. But it was uh, especially these water plants that um, served as a real reminder of how drastic that change is going to be in the future. Um, Another uh, very lyrical example. So we had outdoor projects such as the one with Tamiko. Um, very often um, we will engage the pavilion itself, a gorgeous space, of course. And in this case, uh, it was Spencer Finch, an artist who lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. And he created what he termed the Western mystery. Um, for those of you not familiar with this work, he comes from a literary background, also a very lyrical background. He's a big uh, Emily Dickinson fan, and um, he works with close observation um, of nature and the landscape. So what he did in this case, he deconstructed uh, an image of a beautiful sunset, such as the one we had just um, on the screen um, a minute ago, and then isolated hues, individual hues from uh, that sunset. Uh, as you can see here, and created these glass panels, which of course, you know, with the just air moving in the pavilion would very gently turn and create these overlapping planes with the light coming in, um, you know, especially as the sun is setting. It was a spectacular light show um, on the back of the wall. And the title itself comes from an Emily Dickinson poem. And um, another example, this was actually our um, last um, big project at the Olympic Sculpture Park um, before the pandemic closed everything down, was by the Brazilian artist Regina Silveira. And I'm just showing you three very different um, examples this evening. She um, created a work called Octopus Wrap that literally wrapped the entire pavilion with this design from afar. You might perhaps not be able to tell what it is. And if you get a little closer, and especially indoors, you could see that the designs were tire tracks. Um, kind of uh, the suggestion is the cars are racing along um, on the wall inside the pavilion and are leaving these um, wild tracks all over the building. And of course, um, everybody knows 
of the big octopus uh, living uh, in Puget Sound. She had done another project previously um, uh, with the idea of an octopus and she was so inspired that she turned it into a new project there. So these are some of the things we all love to do. Usually these projects um, would um, change either yearly or by, um, you know, every two years. However, during the pandemic, of course, we had to put that on pause. So we look forward to more such projects in the future future, um, but um, we have to wait a little bit longer, so stay tuned. I just wanted to call out two um, works that were added after the Olympic Sculpture Park uh, opened to the public. One, a lovely but also um, you know, very touching tribute um, to Mary Shirley, who was so instrumental with John in the creation of the Olympic Sculpture Park in the very beginning with Mimi and the Wrights and so many others. And so when she passed away, Ginny Ruffner uh, created this wonderful um, uh, bench in uh, a wild design called Mary's Invitation. It's placed at the top of the Z Pass, in fact, uh, in clear view of uh, the Alexander Calder Eagle um, and the Olympic Mountains, um, as Mimi so beautifully explained, um, the wonderful story of them choosing not their own name, but the name of the Olympics. So if you sit down, you still kind of can see with her the beauty uh, that inspired her and, of course, the incredible park that came. And then uh, in 2014, this was um, an extraordinary addition to the park um, by the Catalan artist Jean Plenza. And um, there is a pretty amazing story about this too because it was a work um, uh, that was um, in a private collection and um, a little too large for the front lawn, as it turned out. And then there was an invitation issued to the museum. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, um, if that work could come to the uh, Olympic Sculpture Park? So, of course, you can imagine amazing conversations. The artist came, uh, visited the park, and um, uh, he was absolutely amazed because the sculpture is of echo uh, going all the way back to Greek mythology. And of course, you know, echo, the, as the story goes, was distracting Hera, who was trying to keep an eye on her philandering um, husband Zeus, who was like always um, running after um, some other woman or um, great opportunity here that he saw. And she was trying to keep an eye on him. And he, uh, Echo was distracting her with her engaging uh, conversation. So Hera, uh, of course, Zeus ran off and, um, um, well, did what he shouldn't do. And so Hera was uh, pretty upset with him and then struck Echo, um, not with silence, but with a curse such that she can only repeat um, fragments of other people's conversations. So modern definition of echo comes uh, from the story. So we're all the way in Greek mythology. Imagine Jean Plenza coming all the way from Spain to facing uh, the Pacific and is absolutely astounded to learn from us that he's looking at Mount Olympus. Uh, not the Mount Olympus, but another mountain uh, uh, called um, Mount Olympus. And so um, the placement of the sculpture uh, that he ultimately determined is such that it, uh, she looks directly um, at the mountain. Um, so that was kind of the anecdote behind there. Looking ahead at this summer, um, programming is starting again at the Olympic Sculpture Park. Some of you will be fans of um, Zumba, um, of yoga at the Olympic Sculpture Park. Look at, um, I mean, it is truly amazing. If you go Saturday mornings to Olympic Sculpture Park, the yoga sessions, it, it couldn't be more beautiful, right? I mean, you have like this cascading um, effect leading down to the auditorium. Everybody brings their mats. It's the most beautiful setting. You would think it was made for yoga classes. And um, of course, music is also part of the program at the Olympic Sculpture Park. And here we have uh, Black Belt Eagle Scout um, on screen here performing a couple of years ago. And looking ahead, um, you can jot down notes here because the park season starts again in July, July 14th, as a matter of fact. And 
will be themed on um, all on water. So our educational team is uh, right in the midst of preparing a really exciting uh, new program for the Olympic Sculpture Park for the months of July and August. And Sea Potential, the Seattle Aquarium, as well as the Puget Sound, um, the Puget Sound Keepers will all be partners in programs. And while you say, well, obviously the programming is going to be all about water because water surrounds the park and is such an essential feature um, of it, there is another reason why this year's programs are very very much looking uh, at water, which has to do with the exhibition that's on view downtown at the Olympic Sculpture Park right now, Our Blue Planet. If you haven't um, had a chance to see it yet, please go. It's open uh, until May 30th, so you have a couple of weeks left, and it is just extraordinary. We, three of my curatorial colleagues were collaborating on this exhibition, which is thematically engaging with the history of water in mythology, uh, water as uh, a, a source of leisure and pleasure, of course, as an essential resource. It addresses ecological um, uh, concerns and climate change, and it is uh, an extraordinary show that kind of combines both works from our collection and, and really fantastic uh, loans here from the region. So you can really sink your teeth into a lot of material there. And with this, I'm going to reach our last slide, and then we will invite everyone on stage so we can take your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Candace. Oh. <laughs> we'll share the mic. All right. Thanks for taking my cue. We've got a, a handful of really wonderful questions here, so we'll get right underway. Um, so I guess I'll pose this um, maybe to you, and you can sort of field accordingly. What was the process in designing the art pieces that make up the park? What was the criteria and the review process? It should just be warm if you if you go. Just hold it to your mouth. It should. Oh. Uh, actually, uh, Lisa Corin, yeah. who uh, Katerina, Katerina cited, Lisa Corin was the chief curator at the time, and one one of the reasons that uh, she took the job was because she ha actually had a vision. Of what, the, of what the art in the park should be. So they're the classic works, like the, the Calder, the Sarah, uh, and, and many, many others. Uh, and then she wanted to get emerging artists who, were a who had a reputation, but were just at the beginning of their career, or mid-career, and so, she did the infrastructure projects, and those are the ones that actually the museum paid for, was to put those in the park, that they would be permanent and, and there. So uh, that was, that was the, the process. One thing that was, except, was e exceptional, I thought, was that collectors did not try and force their art and force their opinions on the museum and on the park. Oh. And so it was a selection. I like the fact that some people say, well, isn't there going to be more art? Mm. But I love the fact that it's open, that children can run. And Marion and Michael used the, the, the metaphor of a petting zoo <laughs> <laughs> for sculpture parks that are really dense. And so uh, that was something that we, we didn't want. But I don't know, Katerina, if you want to add. 
We definitely don't want a petting zoo. I completely <laughs> agree. Um, and, and just to that point, you know, many of the sculptures in the park um, have these beautiful abstracted forms. I mean, again, the Calder comes to mind. We could also think of Tony Smith. We didn't show images of this time around. And they were conceived of at a time when artists were responding to um, outdoor space even conceived of sculpture as a form of architecture that you walk through, and they really require a lot of space, so you don't want to put something else right next to them. So I think there are many reasons why it's um, kind of conceived so spaciously. So, was there, was there any communication with the Coast Salish in creating the park, any collaboration? I think Barbara Brotherton, who's the curator of, uh, I don't know what, what her title is. Native American art. Of Native American art. That uh, she was uh, Vi, I can't remember her last name, Gilbert. but Gilbert, 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 Gilbert. Uh, was, she was involved in the opening of the park. And so I think that's something that is under consideration for the future. I think there, there wasn't, uh, you know, we were aware of it and trying to work on it, but we couldn't do everything at the time. But hopefully in the future, it'll be a wonderful, wonderful work. You already shared that Seattle lost a very, very valuable gym location. <laughs> in, uh, but I know it's, we're all disappointed. Um, but were there any conflicts, other conflicts, with businesses in creating the park? It's such a valuable space that could have been used for so many things, this person says. Well, it, it, there were a whole line of developers who wanted to build there. And in fact, when, when the, there was an RFP out and it had closed when we came in, and it was because Chris Rogers and Lynn Manalopoulos of Laurier Davis Wright Tremaine were so effective in arguing for a park that would be used by the entire community, that would be free, that Unical actually gave us the first option. But it was really touch and go. And we knew, at that time, we knew that we had the, the Shirley's would endow it. The museum had approved the idea of the park. People said, museum can't do a park that's not next to it. That doesn't happen. I think now there are cities that have more of them. But I, I said, let's do it. And so um, that, that's where we, we ended up. But uh, we, had a, we did have a breakfast for the, all the developers <laughs> to show them our ideas for the park and try and diffuse some of the anger over the money they had spent that was for nothing. Uh, I don't think developers are going hungry in the city right now, so I think it all worked out just fine. I think it all, yeah, just to be clear. Um, let's see. Uh, where is the eraser located now? Right? Who was expecting that one? The eraser raced off to Seattle Center, and it is still outdoors, and you can see it there. Uh, I, I will Quickly add, it good. would be lovely to get it back. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like there's a story. I, well, Someone I, has to I, just, I just loved it. It, blo it, it belongs to Paul Allen ah. and to the Allen uh, family now. And I just loved the way it was racing down the hill. <laughs> um, so I'm going to reframe this question slightly. Uh, Maggie, since we've got you, uh, how did the existence of OSP sort of inform the way the Waterfront Project has thought about that connection yeah. and that sort of the north end of, uh, of your project? So I can't speak for Jim Corner, but I know that when he came to present in the competition that we held for the Waterfront Design, that he walked the entire waterfront and he was blown away by the, the sculpture park. And, and of course he's you know considered now one of the preeminent landscape architects in the world. And um, in some sense he didn't want to copy what the sculpture park had done. The, the problem he faced was actually worse because it's 150 feet of bluff to water. It's not the same, the sculpture park is actually less. 
And um, so the whole challenge was the same and he solved it a little differently, but in a way, it's an homage, and I say so in the essay. He did recognize that that solution was the most elegant, and um, given the challenge of the site, it is extraordinary. But it also proved to people that you could do it. I mean, that's the most important thing, is it proof of concept. And I will say, Maggie, together with Leonard Garfield, wrote uh, the last essay mm. about past, present, and future. And it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Which is a segue into how the book became to be. What was the impulse for creating the book at this particular moment? Well, I had always wanted to, to document, to really have, a, uh, to tell the story. It's such an incredible story. The generosity of the donors and the fact that, that the the leadership of the museum and the staff of the museum, that everybody came together to make the park happen. It was also because of the people who were involved, the people in the city. Paul Schell as mayor was really a vital part of it. He told the, we had to divide up the environmental liability and the, the lawyers, uh, they didn't want to accept liability on behalf of the city. And Paul Schell said, we're going to help make this park happen. And all along, the Department of Ecology was fantastic. And it, so, you know, all that came to, I really wanted to tell the story and have it documented and written, and also to point out how extraordinary the park is. So. Uh, we're now at the end of the questions that have been submitted, but I'm going to tap dance for a second so you still got time if anybody has anything still that you're churning. So you've told a story, Mimi, about determination, like from jump, that right. people, right? But was there a moment when the project was imperiled, where like after the moment, there was the time when you weren't sure you were going to get the option, and, but was there a moment when you were further along where you were genuinely worried you weren't going to be able to push it through? I think, I think once, once we had the land, that the, we did come to a, a halt on fundraising when we were purchasing the land. You know, it's to, we basically had to raise $17 million in five months. And we didn't know how we were gonna do it. And we were just lucky that I, and I will tell you, part of it was my husband, who didn't say a word to me, he saw me pacing the floor at three in the morning, worrying about where, where we were going to get the money. We were stuck at five million, and we had to get to 17. And he took it upon himself. He didn't say a word. He, he went, he got his son, and he got Paul Allen to match. Each gave four million. Then we had eight, then we had 13. So then, then we could get smaller donations and we knew we could make it happen. So I, I will say that, that was the, the worst moment in terms of whether we could make it happen. I think there was a lot of frustration, but everybody, all of the energy was going forward. And there was a clarity of vision, so that propelled you all even in like in a dark moment when you're pacing it through. I think Weissman Freddy's design, it really galvanized everybody, including the community. The community, I mean, there were a huge number of people who were involved in making that park happen. So I want to ask, Katerina, you showed us some great images of, of um, Unexpected ways maybe that people are using the park. Is there anything, um, and, and some of those are programmed, those are, right? But what's the, I don't know, most unexpected thing you've observed happening in the park in a positive way? You know, good stuff. <laughs> I don't know if unexpected, but my favorite memory is we had barely moved to Seattle. It's crazy to think um, my kids are not going off to college, but my daughter learned how to bike on the path by the mm. water. It was like, Oh, she had been trying for months and months, and I don't know, she wasn't taking it, and all of a sudden something inspired her and she was pedaling off. Those are the kinds of ordinary things you see um, uh, happening at the park every day. Um, gosh, but unusual things. 
I'm sure everybody has their own memories. How about yeah, over here? Yeah. I think one of the things I want to bring up is going back to the petting zoo. <laughs> uh -oh. uh, you know, one of the brave things that they did at the park was, was not cram it full of stuff and also let people make their own decision about how they want to use it. Yeah. And one of the things I love about the park is the chairs. Um, you can move the chairs. And, and when you go there, you see people off to themselves reading a book, or you'll see 12 all put together for a picnic. And every single night, the grounds crew puts all the chairs back in a perfect line. They rake the gravel smooth. I love that. And I love the way it really is the people's park. They can use it the way they want to use it. And there's a beautiful... Um, well, collaboration with the animals. I mean, you'll see people lying in the unmown parts of the grass, which in the summertime, you've got the beautiful swinging tall grasses and the insects, and you look up and you see the gulls looking down at you and you're looking up at them. So we're using it, they're using it, and it's, uh, it's just a beautiful free place. And I think that that instinct to let people play, let people be, let their imagination enjoy this space. You ask, is there anything surprising about the way people are using it? I think it is that incredible gift of imagination. Let people decide how they want to use it. For some people, it's yoga. For some people, it's daydreaming on their back, just looking up at the sky. I feel there is also this piece where the park in its design, it's where the city meets, you know, the open expanded space. And the thing about the p path is not just that zigzag, which you see more from kind of the higher vantage point, but you feel like you're floating, right? You enter the path, the park, and then you just float over that space, and you don't even, you aren't even aware that these are bridges. It just feels like you're moving along in that space. And I think the thing I just find wonderful is how people, you know, almost like on the beach, let their hair down. It's like, oh, yeah, it's beautiful, you know, and I can just be. And I know Weissman, Freddie, in designing the park, they on the switchbacks, the views are constantly changing, and that was very intentional on their part, as well as having it so that people could go off the main path and would be invited to go off the main path and, and define their own journey. I will say one, the, the red chairs came from a discussion, the Project for Public Spaces in New York, which is an organization uh, that, that works with parks, and if you go behind the New York Public Library, there also are chairs. And one thing that they impressed on us when they came and looked at the park was that people like to be able to determine where they sit. They don't really want a bench that is in a, a permanent location. They want to be able to move around, and that was definitely uh, what inspired the red chairs. They were meant to be three different colors, and there are two colors, but you would never know. Wow. Now I'm going to look. <laughs> Very <laughs> subtle. I've heard that about it before, um, that Bryant Park principle of allowing people to sort right. of arrange their own social relationships. And it, I would have been my, I, I, I love that about it too, that it feels like we're always changing it by our association with and it. And there usually are doubters. People said, oh, so people will walk away with the chairs. <laughs> and I said, well, let's try it. <laughs> and... You know, I don't think any chair, I, I have never counted, but. <laughs> There's a really cool apartment across the street that's got like 100 red chairs in it. Um, so this is not the, I, I like to plan these things. This is not the question I would have landed on or to end, but I, uh, it's important to me because it's, if not my favorite thing, it's certainly one of my favorite things about, about the park. What are the plans for the vivarium moving forward? You know, it's great. I ask myself that question all the time. I think nature has to take its course, right? Right. That's the first thing. So the, you know, the and the thing is, it's not just that the, the tree is decomposing, but of course it's set up as a learning experience because Mark Dion is an artist who's really, very much interested in the kind of systems that we establish as societies through which we learn, whether it's, you know, in this case, kind of a study 
you know, laboratory um, with various tools and books. I mean, you can go deeper into history. But I think um, at some point in time, it would be nice to ask the artist what he envisions, you know, a little, you know, 10, 20 years into the future. When, the, when that was going in, I can remember the conversation with Mark that we had, and he said it would take 100 years for the tree to decay. But I don't, I don't know if that's going to hold up or not. <laughs> Let's just say you've got plenty of time. <laughs> you should rush anyway. Get down there as soon as you can, but not to miss but the, the, the The one thing I wish is that the, that the vivarium could be open more often. You know, it, I think it's, you know, it's too bad that it's often closed. So hopefully the volunteers who used to, um, who used to take care of it. Right. So actually we, we had just figured out um, a better system because the pandemic, before the pandemic sh shut us down, uh, which is we, we are asking people to make appointments because the trouble for a lot of people was, you know, in the summer it gets really hot inside the vivarium and in the winter it's, it's pretty cold. And so um, if people have to kind of stand there for hours and hours and nobody's coming through, we still have to perfect it. But we thought, you know, if we can be open, let's say on Saturdays and otherwise by appointment, something that's more flexible. So that's the direction in which we're going, and I really hope we can, you know, actually um, implement this. I love the fact that there's a stainless steel tree outside. Very and popular a live with tree trees. inside. <laughs> Very popular with the birds, as a matter of fact. I wonder what the expert has to say about that. They love to sit on that tree. Uh, with that, I want to uh, thank you all for this um, invigorating conversation about this really treasured space in our midst. And uh, thank you all for um, not just the gift to the city, but the gift of your time tonight in, um, in bringing it back to our attention. Thank you for, for everything. Thanks. Thank you. And with that, if you don't have your copy yet, go pick up a copy from, of the book from the University Bookstore table. These are not instructions. This is a serving suggestion. Uh, pick up a copy of the book at the University Bookstore table over there, and then uh, there'll be signing copies right over there, signing your book over there in the library. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll see you soon.